Yeah, you'll definitely want to look at this in the Bible if you've got one, because I'm going to uh, share some words that you may not have ever heard. I don't know. But before we get started, if you would, if you want to touch yourself, put your hand on your heart or on your chest area, and just say this with me. Say, I am not a mistake. I am not a mistake. I am here. I am here. In the earth realm. In the earth, earth realm. By divine design. By divine design. However, However, to find myself, to find myself, I must look into two realms. I must look into two realms. realms. The spirit. The spirit. That's the, spirit. that's the realm of the unseen. The realm of the unseen. Into the face of God. Into the face of God. And my own soul. And my own soul. That's the realm of the psychological. The realm of the psychological. Where my senses are. Where my senses are. So great and so strong. So great and so strong. Okay, I want to talk about that, and I want to. Look at it because most people don't uh, see the difference between their um, spirit and their soul. Most people look at the spirit and they look at the soul and pretty much see or pretty much say the same thing. And, and you, you pay attention to what people say. You'll hear people say something about their soul when they're really referring to the things of the spirit or something about the spirit when they're really referring to the things of the soul. And when I read books, I notice that a lot. Reading from uh, educated people. And still, they still cross them up. I mean, I'm talking about profound people who have written uh, 20, 30 books and still will mess, they will cross that up because they're, they're not the same. In the Bible, they're not even looked at the same way. And the soul has more to do, the word soul in the Greek is psyche. We get the word psychology from that root Greek word. Psychology deals with your sensual apparatus and your mind. In the Hebrew, the same word for soul and mind are the same thing. And so the mind is not your brain. Your brain is an organ, just like your heart, your kidneys, your bladder, etc. Those are all organs in your body with different functions. However, the function of your brain is to respond to the mind because the mind is like an auric field that consists all around you. So when you have a thought, you drew that thought from your mind, not from your brain. Mm -hmm. That thought initiated a synapse in your brain and your body responded to that. Mm -hmm. Now that's kind of complicated and difficult for most people to to grasp and to see there's a tremendous distinction between spirit and soul soul is more the breath which is the same I mean the spirit is more the breath which is the same word for God God is spirit tells you that very clearly in the Bible in the book of John God is spirit so, the distinction between the two and the function of the two are important when we begin to know ourselves. And in any of the ancient temples, like for instance the temples of Luxor or the ancient temples that have been around for thousands and thousands of years, right above the door, I mean, you know, we have right here above this door exit because the law requires us to do that. Because it's a public building, you have to have an, that, that that above the door is a sign or a symbol for you to go out. Mm -hmm. But above the door in all of the temples, ancient temples, above the door on the outside coming in was the aphorism or the statement, "Know thyself." Mm -hmm. And the reason they said that was because that was the greatest achievement you could ever achieve in your entire life 
is to know yourself. Mm -hmm. Not to know everybody else, not to try to get to know your partner, your spouse, your kids, etc. what makes them function, what makes them not function, but to get to know yourself. Mm -hmm. And that work we don't, any of us, ever really engage in. Most of us ignore it, most of us pay no attention to it, most of us don't even think about it. Did you have a question? Yeah. No, not a question, but I'm just saying the churches that I've been to, this is to know Jesus. To know Jesus. They don't say about know yourself. Yeah. This is to know Jesus. Let him in your heart. Right. So. The story of Jesus is the story of yourself. <laughs> Yes. When we really come to grasp and understand that story. Yes. It's the, I, I used to say it's the greatest story ever told. Mm -hmm. It's the story of yourself. Yeah. So the scriptures are about the story of yourself. And they use all kinds of characters, all kinds of circumstances, all kinds of places. And all of them, all of them, no matter whether they're characters or, or people or places or or you, it doesn't matter it's something about you something about the function of your body and so I wanted to I, I write in my books a lot you know I, I write I wrote in this little book a lot of stuff on this and I want to read you some of the things that I wrote here to kind of kick this off to get started okay the greatest myth that's ever told is the myth of the book of Genesis and in the, in the Bible, the Christian Bible that we all look at, the Genesis story is not an original story in the Christian Bible. We have been told it is, and therefore we think it is. It's not an original story. It's a story that's adapted from other stories that were told hundreds and thousands of years before the writings of the Hebrew Scriptures and our Genesis story. So the story and how it's told is probably one of the most important stories that we can ever hear and grasp. And yet it's so warped and twisted that the way we've heard it, it's hard to take that out of our hearing and change that story. It's nearly impossible. Because I can say one thing and immediately in your soul, your psyche, your mind, you're going to say, uh-uh, it's a different way. Why? Because you were taught that way. For no other reason than you were just taught that way. If y'all were a born Buddhist in Japan, Zoroastrian, or in some other culture, you wouldn't think the way you think now. Now, that's not right or wrong. It's just you were born here in America, so you think the way Americans think. Mm -hmm. And we call ourselves a godly nation, as though other nations don't do that. No. So the greatest story that's told is the Genesis story, which is a mythological story that's told with an intention to hold the contents of a body of knowledge that you and I are designed to find as we live life. And doing that, trying to find that, is not simple. It's very, it's very, very hard in many cases, <coughs> mainly because of the way we have been taught. So, uh, after saying that, doing that, I want you to, if you will, go with me. I want to look at three passages of Scripture. I'm just going to read all three of them together. They're right in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. So it's easy to get to Genesis chapter 1. And I want to make emphasis on a particular word. Genesis chapter 1, verse 6. Okay, everybody see that? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst. Everybody say, In the midst. In the midst. Now, automatically, you would interpret that in your mind, and even some translations might even say the word middle instead of midst. Some translations may say middle instead of the word midst. 
But I would say this. I, I want to put this on the board, and I want to, uh, uh, want to put a Hebrew, a Hebrew word on the board. And uh, over here, I'm going to use this Hebrew word. Uh, and Sheen, Mim, Yod, Shin Mim Yod Mim. Okay? Shin Mim Yod Mim. That's a Hebrew word. It's used, it's used a lot in, Gen, in the first chapter of Genesis. It's used quite a bit. It's an important word, and it's used over and over. And, I, and I'll explain that word to you in just a minute. But right here, I'm going to just I'm just going to kind of draw a slash through here and say this is the midst. If you want to call it the middle, I'm going to call it something else. I'm going to call it the core. Mm -hmm. And I would call it I would call it the heart. But if I were to say your heart, every one of you, I don't care who you are. If I were to say your heart, you're going to you're going to just put your hand right here on your chest and focus on the center of your being and think that's it. But if I said your core, you're not going to think that. You see the difference in what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Even though this word heart and core are used interchangeably, but it always, even though it's used interchangeably, it always refers to the core of your being. Mm -hmm. And to understand your core is the first step to understand yourself. Know yourself. What am I going to do? I'm going to know my core. The core of my being. You could say, I don't know my heart. What's my heart's attention? But if I say heart, you're going to focus on that place in the middle of your chest. And that's not where I want to put you focus. I want to put you focus on something besides that. Mm -hmm. I want to put you focus on your core. But I want to show you what your core is. Mm -hmm. Because your core affects your whole being, every bit of it. Sometimes your heart just affects that place in the very middle right here. So, again, if you watch this passage, and God said, let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters, and let it, let it, the ferment, divide the waters from the waters. The waters, you see, this glyph right here, I, I don't, this, everybody say nim, nim. nim. That glyph has a numeric value of 40 and it always represents water. Always. It doesn't matter where you go in scripture, it'll always represent water. Whether you, like for instance, if you look at Moses and the Red Sea, uh, if you look at uh, uh, Noah and the ark and the water, anywhere you find a, a water story, or even in Jesus, when Jesus is telling all kinds of water stories, like walking on the water, or being in a boat and being cast out in the water. Uh, all the different water stories that always refer to Mim 40. And then this word, this glyph, this has a numeric value of 600. And it also refers to water. That may be a little complicated or maybe contradictory at the moment, but it will clear it up in just a minute. So both of these glyphs are water glyphs, and they refer to water in different aspects of water. Now, everything on the earth is basically from water. The earth is 75% water or more. Your physical body is 75 to 90% water. And, and there's, you know, the, there's just a lot of a lot of science on that very fact. And, you know, if, if science today is looking out into space to find a planet to where there could possibly be life on that planet, the first thing they look for is water. Because if they no water, there'd be no life. Okay? There could be all kinds of precious metals there, but in no water, no life. Water is the prerequisite of life, period. If you don't have that, you don't have it. All right, go with me to Genesis chapter 2, next chapter. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. It says, and out of the ground, 
May the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst, everybody say in the midst, in the midst. of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to put another little analogy up here, which I do occasionally. And this is pretty obvious as to what it is. Everybody, everybody sees that now. Picture's worth a thousand words, remember, right? Mm -hmm. So what is that? That's a tree. That's a tree. This is the earth, the horizon, the ground. This is the roots, and this is the trunk and the limbs on the tree. So, everybody, read this verse with me again. I, I'm, I'm drawing this tree analogy because it's used right here in this analogy. Okay? Verse 9 says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's good for, that's good every tree that's pleasant for sight and good for food, the tree of life and also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life and also in the middle of the garden or in the midst, in the core of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now those two, they, most people separate and say, well, there's two trees mentioned there. There's not two trees. I even have a book called Two Trees in the Garden. <laughs> <laughs> and most people say, yeah, there's two trees in the garden. There's one tree over there that you can, you can eat at, and it'll give you life forever. And then there's another tree over there that you can eat the apples off it, and you're sinful, and you'll die forever. Two separate trees. And I said, no, no, there's no tr two trees. There's the tree of life in the core, also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, there, and so it's the same tree. So if, if I'm using the tree analogy up here, look at this. The life of this tree is in the unseen realm or under the dirt, correct? Yes. You can't see it. The root system, you can't see the root system, right? Okay. The root system is where the life is at. It's in the unseen realm. See, if I look at you and I see your physical body, I'm not seeing your life. The life of your physical body is in the unseen realm. It's from the air you breathe and get into your body and extract. That's your life. That's your life source, right? Cut your air off. No life, right? Yeah. And so then what you do see is the fruit are the results of the tree, which is the knowledge. That word knowledge is, comes with gnosis and deals with your soul psyche. Okay, thought and so follow that. And again, right here, I'm going to use this this surface. This is the core. Okay. Now then, this one really gets tricky. In the next chapter, chapter three. Each one of these chapters and each one of these stories have been twisted and told in a literal, natural sense, but they're not literal and natural. They're more biological and anatomical they're referring to your physical body every one of these stories is referring to your physical body and I'm going to try to show you that because the key of scripture is for you to know yourself because if you can know yourself then you can know what makes you tick right know why you get mad why you get glad and <laughs> all the other things that happens to you now then in Genesis chapter 3 and look at verse 3 with me we're going to come back and tie some of this, these stories together in just a minute. But of the fruit of the, verse 3, Genesis chapter 3, but of the fruit which is in the midst, everybody say in the midst. In the midst. In the midst of the garden, God said, you will not eat, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Wow. Okay. Now then I'm going to put another analogy right here. And y'all are familiar with this analogy. Right? This is my stick man. Or I'm just going to say this is you and you have you have grown to be what you are right now. Right? Mm -hmm. You have you started out 
just you started out, you were almost weightless because you were just one cell. And because your cells just continue to expand, you look in your mirror now, you're not weightless no more. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Most of us don't die. Mm -hmm. So, now in the midst, now let me do a, let me draw the midst of this one right here. This one is really tricky. If I could kind of get it to this is the midst. Or I'm going to call this the core. Okay? And, and of course, if you look at that, that's in the middle. Now, if I were to take this core out of my stick man, and I stood this core up over here on the side and give you a side picture of it, I used to have this uh, when I first started taking Connie to the to the uh, neurologist. He had this uh, rubber brain that he would take apart and say, "Here's what's happening in the brain with Alzheimer's." Alzheimer's. But if you pull the brain out and you most of you are thinking of your brain, you, you're right here, correct? You're looking at your, that's, this is inside your skull, right? Mm -hmm. But see, that's not your brain. Your brain has a spinal column that goes all the way down your neck, all the way down to your tailbone. So actually, your brain goes from the top of your head all the way down to your pelvic area or to your sex organs your gonads, and that's your brain, that's your core. So if I'm looking at the core of the tree, I'm, not, I'm looking from the tip of the roots to the very top of the limbs, the core's in that. If I'm looking at this word right here, sheen mim, yod mim, I'm doing exactly the same thing. If I'm looking at the core of this word, I'm looking at it from the sheen all the way down to the final mim. But now this word right here is called heaven. Now all three of these words, all three of these analogies, all three of these stories refers to the same identical thing. Do you know what that is? They all refer to the core of your being. What's in your core? What's in, you can call it your heart, but if I say your heart, then you are limit it. But if I say your core and you understand the core means everything from the top of my brain, that's my cerebrum, to my sexual organ, that's my core. And so whatever is going on from the top of my head to my sexual organ, whatever is going on in me, and generally every bit of that is connected to your psyche, your soul, your psychology. How you think, what you think. Everybody, can you see that? Can you grasp? You can't kind of grapple with that. <coughs> now, the word here, and I want you to look at this with me in Genesis chapter. Uh, in Genesis chapter three, we're going to look at it and go backwards just a little bit here. It says, "But of the fruit of the tree." Everybody with me? Genesis 3, 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you will not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now when you read that, what do you think? Well, You're going to die. So when you say the word with your mouth, die, you mean cessation of being. That's what you mean, right? Right? Yeah. What if that word right there in Hebrew has nothing to do with cessation of being? Would you, what, what about that? Look at this. He, now when he said that, is, is this a quote from something he said earlier? You, you, you look at it. Verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the core of the garden, God said, God said, so obviously God said this earlier. God said, you will not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And of course, somebody says, God didn't say anything about touching it. God said eating it. Well, I'd like to see them eat it and not touch it. 
I mean, can you do that? I don't think you can. So if you're going to eat an apple, you got to touch the apple. To eat the apple. <coughs> or maybe you could get somebody else to cut it up and pick it up and stick it in your mouth for you. <laughs> but I really don't think that's the implication here. So let's go back over to Genesis chapter 2 and let's look at that part and let's just see what that says. And I want you to follow me with this. It says, Verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. You shall surely die. That word actually, and I want you to hear this with me, it's med -aw. Med, you know, it's like medicine. You're talking about taking your meds, M-E-D. med -aw. And it aw is like saying, Ah, oh, you know, like that's wow. Ah, oh. you, you get that? So, can you say that? Say, med ah. Oh. Now, that's the word right here for die. And actually, the word means to compete with something or to to grapple competition, like like in sports. Sports permit competition. So he said, "Wait a minute. If you partake of this fruit or life." It's going to create in you a competition. Oh, really? It hadn't got anything to do with cessation of being. Now, is there a word in Hebrew that has to do with cessation of being? Hold your place right here in Genesis chapter 2 and just turn over a page or two to Genesis chapter 6. Everybody there? Genesis chapter 6. Verse 17. Y'all found it? Are we learning? Wheels turning? Wheels turning? Thinking? Hopefully. Thinking. Verse 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that's in the earth shall die. Same English word, but totally a different word from the words you just read in Genesis 2 and 3. This word right here is gava. How many of y'all have ever ordered the coffee called gava? Have y'all never ordered none of that gava? You never had it? I, I used to order it a long time. It was really good coffee, very expensive. Good coffee. I, I'm sure they still, matter of fact, every... Every year they'd send me a brand new coffee pot. As a matter of fact, I still have a coffee container that I put my coffee in that I got from them 15 or 20 years ago when I ordered their coffee. This Hebrew word, gava, uh, actually means, now get this, watch this, to breathe out or expire. Because, see, if you breathe out and do not breathe back in, Guess what will happen to you? You'll expire. You'll die. Now wait a minute. Well, wait just a minute. Now why in the world would they use a word here, Gavai, in Genesis chapter 6? And, that, and the tremendous thing is around this story of Noah, which I'm not talking about that. That's a whole different, that's, that's not just an hour session. That's going to be a whole month or six months to just teach you that Noahic story. Because it's all about grace. Every bit of, everything gets about grace anyway. Because it's not what you do, but it's what the grace of God does in you. That's the most important part, right? So that's a different story. But that's the only place that you're going to find that word that you're associating die as cessation of being, or to expire, or to breathe out. Neither of these places over here in chapter 3 or in chapter 2 when it says, if you eat this fruit, you're going to die. No, if you eat this fruit, you're going to engage in a contention. Or in other words, you're going to engage in a competition. How is that possible? Just exactly like it says in the midst of you in Genesis chapter 1 verse 6. Let's go back over there. Follow me back with this. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 1 verse 6. Chapter 1 verse 6 and see if we can get the content of this story. Chapter 1, before I read verse 6, back up to verse 1. <laughs> I'm sorry. Verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven. This word right here is heaven. 
Shin Mem Yod Mem. The word means the waters above and the waters below. If I were to take my stick man and divide him right here in what you would call the heart, which I always do like that, these would be the waters above and these would be the waters below. Okay? The, in other words, what they refer to right out of the starting gate here, they refer to the spiritual aspect of your being and they refer to the soul aspect of your being. Or in other words, the soul deals with your psychological, sensual apparatus. So from the spiritual aspect of your being, God created you a body for God to live in. Right? So God created a home, and that home happens to be you. Let's see, I had uh, I had my the lost gospels in there and I meant to bring it out because I wanted to read you something out of the gospel of Thomas that was actually they tried to destroy the gospel of Thomas the Catholic Church did destroy every book they could find of the Gnostic writers after the Council of Nicaea in 326, they tried to destroy all of the early church writings which dealt with the Gnostic Gospels and Gospels that were not entered into this canon that you and I have that we call the Bible. The Gospel of Thomas was the most, one of the more important ones that they had because the Catholic Church grappled over whether to put the Gospel of Thomas in or the Book of John in. Why? Because both of those Gospels were Gnostic. So it's nothing about the Gospel of John that you can take literal. You follow what I'm saying when I say that? In other words, if Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, can you take that literal? No, you can't even do that. He's not here for us to do that. I mean, if He was, His flesh would be rotted. So you, so you can't do that. Right? So that whole gospel, everything in that gospel is centered around that concept that it's not literal, it's not natural. The same thing was true with the gospel of Thomas. They understood that the story of Jesus was not referring to a literal man, but they were, it was referring to the spiritual aspect of your being. So that then you understood, I am Jesus in my body, and Jesus is me in my body. So if you understood that, the story would make a lot more sense than it does if you try to make it something happen 2,000 years ago. If 2,000 years ago, then you have a good excuse of things God did, but He don't do no more. Well, what kind of a God would that be? We're going to serve a God that did things, but don't do things. <laughs> no, I don't think I'm going to go there. If God is not the same, Hello, yesterday, today, and forever, then why would we want to call it God? If God can't do today what God did then or in the future, then why would we want to call that God? Why would we want to serve that? I don't, I don't think we really would if we got everything correct. So see here in this verse 6, and God said, let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. In other words, it's showing you that your core becomes the center or the core of your being even though you're a water vessel. So you have divine waters above that refer to the spiritual that builds the physical. And then you have the waters below that refer to the soul or the psychological. I see a, in, in things I see sometimes maybe different from the way th other people see things. I see things going on in our country and in our nation that have more to do with psychological issues than any other issues that I know of. They have more to do with how we psychologically are responding to the things that's happening in our world than any other thing. Because if you're moved by the psychological things that's happening in the world, you're moved by your sight, your smell, your taste, your feeling, etc. And aren't we pretty well moved that way? Yeah, we really are. Most of us are moved by that. Why? Because we have made that the most important. And I'm not saying that it's lack of important, period, because you're a whole being. 
the, your spirit is as important as your soul. Mm -hmm. See? Your divine side is as important. As a matter of fact, it takes one to have the other. You ain't going to have no physical body if you don't have the divine breath or the spirit in your physical body. Mm -hmm. And if all you got is the divine breath, you ain't got no body, so you ain't got nothing. <laughs> so it takes the two. The two is what makes something real. If you don't have the divine, the spirit, and the physical married together with a core to pull them together, you ain't got neither. And the fact that you have got both makes you awesome, makes you special. It makes you more than you can possibly imagine that you could be. So go back with me now to Genesis chapter 2. And I want you to see this. You will die. Actually, it just, the word that we have here, med ah. I mean, you hear these two words, med ah, translated for die. It just actually means competition. There is now between that which is your sensual apparatus. And that which is your divine apparatus, a competition. That's not wrong. It's that competition that makes you live. And you can, you have, and you, nobody else, you only, you have the right to choose which one of those that you want to be in control or be the stronger in your life. And we have all pretty much made a choice. And we, and we have all pretty well followed that choice. And that choice wasn't right, and that choice wasn't wrong. It's just that we did not understand. We didn't get the proper instructions. We didn't get the right knowledge to show us what would happen if we chose. If we chose the sensual above the spiritual, or the spiritual above the sensual. We didn't know. I didn't. I bet you none of you knew. Nobody's ever told you. You sure didn't go to church and learn any of this because they don't tell it. They don't know it. And you sure didn't go to school and learn any of this because they don't tell it and they don't know it. So how are you going to get this? Well, this was common knowledge 2,000 years ago. This was the knowledge that was known all over the country, all over the land. Every, everybody knew it and everybody knew ever how you implemented this knowledge for yourself would be how that you lived yourself. And nobody was, was demanded you live this way because this is how I live. I eat, I eat steak, so y'all order, every one of y'all eat steak. No, I eat nothing but vegetables. Every one of y'all ought to eat vegetables. Now we've divided ourselves like that, and that's how we're so divided, it's ridiculous. 2,000 years ago, it wasn't that way. 2,000 years ago, this was common knowledge. It was called gnosis. And Jesus said this actually in John 8. If you want to just flip over there real quick with me, find the Gospel of John and I'll just read it to you. John chapter 8, verse 32. It's the modern King James Version. It's red letters. <laughs> that makes a difference, y'all, because they learned that you could print pages with red ink as well as you could print it with black ink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus said these. Uh, oh yeah, that's, that's right. Now that after we got red in the printing press, those are the words of Jesus. <laughs> right, okay. John 8, 32. Everybody there? John 8, 32, it says, and you shall know. You see that word know? That's the word gnosko comes from the word gnosis. Gnosis is divine intuition. It's something that every one of you have. It's not something that you gain because you read dozens and dozens of books. It's called knowledge. Gnosis. Gnosko. That was, that's why the early church in its infancy from three, around 350 B.C., 
up until around 326 CE, that whole period of time of over 600 years was considered the, the era of the Gnostics. And the knowledge that the Gnostics was ha was, did have was infiltrating the whole earth, the whole world. It was like a brush of fire. It spread everywhere, spread into all cultures, all nations, all around the world. Didn't matter. Why? Because it combined ideologies. It didn't divide them. It combined the ideas that were in Zoroaster or the ideas that were in Egypt or the ideas that were in Hebrew or the ideas that were in Buddhism or the ideas that were in the Hindu or the ideas that were in the Mayan. It combined them all and said they're all saying the same thing, but they're saying it in the culture in which they live. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Using different analogies to say the same thing. Like if you went to Maya, they had the Quetzal bird, which was actually called the serpent in the sky. Because the bird, when it flew, because of the way its tail designed, it actually looked just like a snake crawling on sand. Because the bird would fly just like this. And, they, and the Mayans built a temple. Matter of fact, when we, I was down there eight or ten years ago, my, my whole family, we went down there, and me and Austin and my sons-in-laws, we all stood in front of the Mayan temple and did this. And, and the temple is so designed, when you do that, that sound, oh, all. It, it, kind of, it was the craziest thing you've ever seen. It would echo back to you with that sound of that bird. Hmm. Now that's, that, they have a science and a technology we don't even have today. You go look at the pyramids and crawl through the pyramids and see that the pyramid is built on the design of the human body. Because it's a temple about the structure of the physical body. <laughs> you know, and we, we think this book is about a history of a people. This book is about the mystery of you, the divine people of the of the of the gnosis, of the God. Hallelujah. And so when we start to see that this book becomes a living book, it becomes alive inside you because that's what it's designed to be. It gives you life, and you begin to realize now. If I know what I'm, if I know what I'm made of, and who I am, I can learn to live from the core of my being, and I can combine my upper to my lower. I can combine my divine to my human. I can divine. I can combine my God nature to my physical nature, and make it one. And that's exactly what the word "get saved" means. In the Greek, when you read get saved, the word sozo, make whole. Make it one. Because we are divided in our core. And we've got to come back to that place. We've got to come back. So this John 8, 32, Jesus said, these are red, red words, and you shall know, not believe. The word believe is pistis. That word right there is gnosko in the Greek. It's not what you believe right. makes the difference. It's what you know. You can believe all kinds of stuff. And we do. We, we do. You can go anywhere, any church you want to, and I promise you, they believe all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. It ain't stuff. <laughs> it's just real, real stuff. And they'll fight you over their stuff. Because they told, they were told, our stuff's the right stuff. <laughs> What they, what they tell you down the street or across the road, that's the wrong stuff. But you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's right. Okay, And that's what you're after. You're after the truth. The truth is in the core of your being. Mm -hmm. And to learn to get to hear that, to learn to get to tap into that, wow, that's a whole different thing. Getting into the core of you, in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. Learning how to, to choose the life mm -hmm. and the knowledge, the gnosis. Mm -hmm. Gee, that word knowledge, that we just, the tree of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. huh. When you take of that tree of the knowledge, it will create in you a contention. 
And that contention is not, it's not meant to be bad. That contention is meant to unveil and to reveal the difference between your physical sensual apparatus and your soul spiritual apparatus. But your work is to make the two one. So that you live from both. So that there you look at it, you smell it, you see it, you feel it. You say, hmm, I think that's pretty good. I believe I'll have this son. Or you listen to it from the spirit, from the intuitive, from the place of gnosis. And you say, hmm, I think that's pretty true. I'll have this son. And then you start to live. And when, when we do, as we start to do this, mm -hmm. we'll start to heal our bodies. Yeah. We'll start to heal the, the, the psychological pains that we carry. We all do. We carry psychological pains. The psychological pains affect the physiological pains. Because they're, two, they're one. Mm -hmm. They're connected right there in my physical body. So we have all kinds of sickness and diseases. That's just simply a result of our division or the things that's gone over wrong in our physical body. The word for soul is nefesh in Hebrew and the word for spirit is ruach. Can you hear the difference? Ruach, spirit, nefesh, soul. One of them has to do with your breathing apparatus, your spirit, your divine essence. The other one has to do with your psychological aspect. Yeah. How you think, how you feel, the way you see it through your eyes. You see it through your eyes, your way. I see it through my eyes, my way. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's meant and designed to be. So, hallelujah, we'll just disconnect right here. I want to talk a whole lot more about this because of this word die and the usage of this word throughout the scriptures. And, and you know, you can see the words. It, again, you know, what really started me in years ago looking at words and then I could look at a word even though it had the same English uh, interpretation, like, for instance, the word die mm -hmm. in English says it means the same thing to all of us. Basically, expire, cessation of being. Mm -hmm. But when I looked at it in Hebrew and I realized, wait, this one's med-ah and gva. Wow, those, those two don't even sound alike. They're not even spelled alike. They don't even have the same numeric value. And mm -hmm. in, in my light and face, mine says, well, then I bet they're not the same. <laughs> <laughs> And so I begin to chase these rabbit trails. And, oh, they're not the same. <laughs> and you get to, you got you get to where you see. Oh, okay, this word means this, and this word means. Oh, they don't even mean anything but close to the same. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's a beautiful picture when you start to see that uh, we're combining the divine and the human. We're combining the spirit and the soul. And I was always told in, quote, Christendom, if I wanted to find the divine, I'd have to go out yonder to heaven to another planet somewhere and get it. Because that's where it's at. As long as I'm here, I'm just an old sinner. Uh -huh. And uh, there ain't no hope for me here because God's going to destroy this and burn it up anyway. That's not true, folks. Those are lies. We've all been told that lie. And we just embraced it and believed it. So, okay. But it's not true. Yeah. God created the earth because it's, it tells you in the scripture God loves the earth. That's right. Matter of fact, you all say it in John 3 16, for God so loved the world. Wow, I thought he wanted to burn it up. It's just your world. <laughs> I think he told me he was going to burn it up. Oh, he loves it. Yeah. <laughs> God so loved it that He gave it to you. You are God's divine son, daughter, etc. Okay, any questions or any? All the lost scriptures. And uh, this was found at Nag Hammadi. And 
most people are familiar with the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes. Uses yeah. that terminology. And the reason people are familiar with that is because the uh, the religious community saw fit to promote the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they did not want to promote the Nag Hammadi finds. They were found at the same time. They were found between 1945 and 1959, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi finds. But they kept this they kept this information silent for up until up until the late 80s found it they found all these books in uh, 45 46 and 47 they found these books but the catholic church had already burnt all of these books because they did not want these books out because of the information that's in these books and the reason for that is, is just like the book of Enoch, which they never destroyed, but they put it on the back burner and told you that it's a book that you can't read because you don't understand it because it's so contradictory and it, it's so uh, hard to read. And it is because it's written in a mythical, symbolic language that if you don't understand the myth or the symbols, you can't interpret it. You get some really wild and bizarre ideas. Because if you start to thinking that it's referring to a literal, when it's not, it's referring to a spiritual, but using different ideas. In other words, to say that a certain creature God made had a bird body and a human head. <laughs> or etc. Or it had a horse body and a human head. If you read a book like that and you think, well, buddy, God was really confused when he made all that stuff. Because, <laughs> see, what he was referring to, like the body of a horse, a horse usually represents the strength and speed of the spirit. And then you put a human head on it. It's referring to the physical, sensual apparatus. And there again, it's merging the spirit and the physical together by using animals and different birds, different things. But it wasn't saying that God made these weird creatures, but that's what they tried to convince us. And so they destroyed all the writings. They got rid of the books. And so these were found, these books were found, and now then the church has to deal with them. They're having a real hard time dealing with them because now then these books will tell the truth that they didn't want you to know. So I just want to read something here. And Jesus said, now, uh, let's see if I even address that up front. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Jesus said, If they say to you, Where did you come from? Say to them, We came from the light. The place where the light came into being on its own accord and established itself and became manifest mm -hmm. through image. Hmm. Mm -hmm. If they say to you, is it you? Say, we are its children and we are the elect of the living Father. If they say to you, what is the sign of your father in you? Say to them, it's movement and peace. His disciples said to him, when will this peace of the dead come about? And when will the new world come? And he said, what you look forward to has already come. Hmm. And you don't recognize it. Yeah. That's just a paragraph. Mm -hmm. Let me read you another thing he said. Jesus said, If those who lead you say to you, See, the kingdom is in the sky. 
They told you that now for 2,000, well, for 1,700 years. Mm -hmm. They told you it was in the sky. In other words, they told you it's out there in heaven somewhere. That's where the kingdom's at, it's out there. Mm -hmm. If those who lead you say to you, see, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will go before you. Yeah. If they say to you it's in the sea, then the fish will go before you. Rather, the kingdom is inside you. And it's outside of you. And when you come to know yourself, then you will become known and you will realize that it is you who are the kingdom, the son of the living God. Wow. See, I didn't want you to know this material. Mm -hmm. This just goes on and on and on. You know, and, and this is this is just a, a little simple book. Uh, Jesus said, "If one who knows all still feels a personal deficiency, he is completely deficient." <laughs> uh, yeah. His disciples said unto him, When will the kingdom come? And Jesus said, It will not come by you waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying, Here it is or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the whole earth and men do not see it. So in this book right here, there are 56 books. Like the Gospel of Thomas is only like, like eight pages, ten pages. Uh, but in this book, there's, I think, 46 or 56 books, just in this one book. And then I have another big book. It's called The Lost Books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. and they were just books that never, ever got uh, introduced mm -hmm. and put in into... I mean, they're, they're, right, they're still, obviously they're still available. You can get them if you, if you look for them, but. Uh, Is that book still in print? This one? Oh, yeah. Barnes & Noble. You can go to Barnes & Noble and pick it up on the shelf right now. Lost scriptures. Mm -hmm. You can go to Barnes & Noble and get it. And this one is by Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is, Bart Ehrman chairs the, the studies of historical religion at Chapel Hill, North Carolina, not much over an hour, well, no, it's more than that, not much over a couple hundred, 150 miles through the mountains over here in the Carolinas. Bart Ehrman. And Bart Ehrman has written somewhere close to 20-something uh, books, maybe five, ten of them become pretty popular. Uh, I have probably five or ten of his writings. He started out as a Baptist minister, uh, and the, the, the more he began to do his research as a professor, mm -hmm. the more he backed away from that ideology until now, after his 30-something years, uh, he basically just espouses spiritual truth. No religion, period, whatsoever. He didn't claim to be a Baptist or anything. He interprets the script, the law of scriptures, or the books that were found in 45 to wherever. 40, yeah, 45, 49. Well, and well, so there was are, there, are there other people, other people that oh, have yeah. done the same yeah. thing? But they, yeah, they interpret the same one because these, most of these were in Greek. Oh. Most of these, some of them were in Hebrew. So, but most of them were in Greek. Well, when you read the history of these books, uh, some that I've read, they canonized what they thought was the real works, and then they based their saying these were not, you know. And if they weren't canonized, they wouldn't put it in the King James Version. Yes. It was after it was found. If they couldn't literalize them. Yes. A lot of the writings could not be literalized. In other words, no matter what they did, even though they changed a lot of the writings, mm -hmm. 
Like for instance, Matthew, Matthew and Mark, the way we have it by the English translation, I'd say right at half of each one of those books, half of what it says is added to it. It's not even in the like for instance, y'all have heard the story that Jesus said it'd be better for you if a, if a milestone was uh, put around your neck and you was thrown into the pit of hell and da 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 that, that's, all, that's all embellished. None of that's in any none of that's in any translation whatsoever. There are sometimes whole pages in Matthew and Mark that are not even in the translation. The last half of the 16th chapter, if you have an expensive annotated note reference Bible, this is a like a Dake. Uh, Dake is an annotated note reference Bible. I studied from it because I studied from Dake. If you look at uh, Matthew, Mark, if you look at Mark chapter 16, and I'll read this to you. Mark chapter 16. And again, it doesn't, it don't matter to me what translation. You can go get a Zondervan, you can get a Nelson. If you buy an expensive Thompson chain reference, buy an expensive one that has its own annotated notes. And if they've done a lot of research, they'll have this same thing. For instance, let me show you, let me just read this to you. In Mark 16, it starts out, verse 1, it says, When the Sabbath was passed, when Mary Magdalene, da 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 And then it comes down to the last verse that's in the, in the only, they don't have an original, but the one they have, that they only, it only dates to around the 4th, 5th, 6th century. Somewhere around 5, 600. They don't got one that goes all the way back. They don't have it because it didn't exist. And then this was as it went and went quickly out and fled to the sepulchre, and they trembled and were amazed. Neither said, neither there said anything to any man, for they were afraid. The end. And there's a note right there, because that's the first eight. And actually, here in this chapter, there's twenty verses. There's twelve more verses. And here's what the note says. I'll just read over here. It is admitted by all that the overwhelming mass of witnesses in the manuscripts that the fathers are in favor of them and that the two oldest Greek manuscripts, the Sinaitic and the Vatican, none of these verses are in them. Wow. Well, let me read you some of what they've added. These are the verses they've added. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Oh, that's not in the original? No. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not, he be damned and sent to hell. Not in the original. Mm -hmm. Added. And these signs will follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. And if they drink any, if they pick up serpents, they, they won't hurt him. And if they drink any deadly thing, they won't be hurt. Added. None of it's in the original. Mm -hmm. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's there if you just read it and look at it and say, oh, I done that to some pastors. <laughs> and they got so mad at me. Oh, God, I ain't going to cuss. <laughs>